Well, this morning, as I've already said, we're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount. And I am going to set the, the scene for this uh, as we get into this particular text. But let me just go ahead and read it to begin with. Uh, we are going to be looking at or actually reading in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, or yes, yeah, 32. But we're only going to be looking at verses 27 through 30 this morning. We're going to be looking at the other two verses this evening. The reason being is it's just too much to deal with in, in one sitting. But let's go ahead and read what we're going to be looking at this morning and this evening to begin with. Beginning in verse 27. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. If you have questions regarding these, these last two verses, make sure you come this evening, okay? Because we're not going to have time to deal with them uh, this morning. So what Jesus is dealing with overall here is the topic of the seventh commandment, what it means to commit adultery. And what he's telling us is it's not just the act itself, but it can also be committed in the heart and it can be committed in our relationships if we have marriages that end, but they don't end on biblical grounds and we contract a new marriage. Now we're gonna look again at the first part this morning, the second part, this evening. So may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now let's just back up again and, re and remind ourselves that Jesus has been in the Sermon on the Mount explaining to us the blessings of the gospel. The qualities that he possesses himself personally, his, his character, his righteousness, that he works into our lives. Remember, the gospel transforms. We don't stay the same people we were. Uh, if we are completely unchanged, we don't really even know the Lord. Salvation is more than just a matter of making a profession or, or having a set of beliefs. It is a change of heart. Jesus makes us like himself. And those changes, Jesus says, makes us to be salt and light in the world. We become a preservative to those around us by our, our high, higher moral standard and the way that we communicate with other people and the way that we live. We become light in the world, again, by our character, by living like Jesus. He was certainly the light that comes into the world, and he has put that light in us, and we begin to shine that same character, but also through our words. But this change that our Lord Jesus makes in each one of us, we need to listen carefully, also gives us the power to keep the law of God. And, and why is it important that that actually take place in our lives? It's because of what Jesus said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Unless our righteousness, our obedience to the commandments is greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus says we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now I do want you to notice what he said in our text. And we're going to look at those verses about plucking out the eye and cutting out the hand. Uh, at the end. But he says, unless we do that, unless we put those sins to death, we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but rather we will be cast into hell. Did Jesus believe in hell? Certainly. And he taught about it and he warned about it because it's real and th there's a very real possibility of people entering into it. So how do we escape it? We escape it only through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But how do we know that we have escaped it? We know because our lives are being transformed into the image of Jesus. Again, I would, I would just ask everybody to listen to what I'm saying 
because it's very important that we hear everything that the Lord has to say. Jesus here was not speaking about his imputed righteousness, you know, that which we receive from him by trusting in him. He is talking about our personal righteousness. It must be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, he is the one who works that righteousness in us. It's not a work that we do. He does it through his Holy Spirit, whom he gives to us through the gospel. We do need to realize, apart from his grace, apart from his mercy, apart from what he gives to us through his Holy Spirit, we would be no different than the scribes and the Pharisees. We would be exactly like them. Our obedience would be no better. But now, how is it supposed to be greater? What is it we're supposed to see in ourselves that we don't see in them? Well, in the ways that he's already described in the Beatitudes, but also in the way that Jesus is explaining in this section of the sermon. It will go beyond the righteousness of the religious leaders of Israel who looked at the law of God and said, if I just keep the letter of the law, if I just do what, what is written, that will be enough. Well, Jesus says, that isn't enough. We will go beyond that. We will keep the spirit of the law. We will keep what the Lord really intended. Now, I know that this expression, the spirit of the law, is often used to actually lower the standard rather than raise the standard. Well, I may not be keeping the letter of the law, but I'm keeping the spirit of the law, and usually what they mean is something less than what God requires. But Jesus actually says the spirit of the law is, is deeper, it's higher. It's, it's a certain sense stricter than what is being taught today. It is a higher standard, the standard that Jesus set essentially in his own life, by his own example. That is the way that we will live because that is the way we are going to want to live. Now, we've already seen that applied to the sixth commandment. Not only will we keep the letter of the law, we will not murder other people, but we'll keep it in our hearts. We won't want to murder them. We'll not only resist the action, but we'll also fight against the desires that are in our hearts that lead up to it. And if we do have those desires in our heart and they're expressed in some way towards a, a brother or a sister or a neighbor and we offend them, we will work towards reconciliation. We won't let it go, but we will deal with our offenses, Jesus tells us, before we come to worship him. We will keep short accounts. So this is one way in which our righteousness will be greater, what the Spirit of God will do in us to make us different than the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, as we work our way through what Jesus is telling us about each of these commandments, let's remember a couple of things. First of all, he's not just telling us what his spirit will give us the desire to do. He's also giving content to what that desire is, what he wants us to do. I've been telling you we should not look at the Beatitudes as commands to, to do these things or to be this way, but these are things which the Lord will actually work in us by his Holy Spirit. But how do we know what the Spirit of God is actually working in us by looking at the Beatitudes? He, so understanding that's what he's working, it gives us then some focus to what we ought to be aiming at and what we ought to be yielding to, which, what it is that's in us that is of the Spirit and what is of the flesh. Because we have two sets of desires and we have to be able to distinguish them. That which is of the Spirit are these qualities we read about in the Beatitudes and how that's going to express itself is, of course, through the way we keep the commandments and the way that Jesus is explaining them. So the Spirit gives us the desire and then he tells us what it is that he also wants us to do. Augustine once wrote this, and I've quoted this several times, but think about how it applies to what I'm saying. He said, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. In other words, tell me what's right and then give me the ability to do what is right. He realized God will do that and he can't do it on his own. But what we're suggesting here is that perhaps that statement of Augustine should be put the other way around. Lord, give what you command by your spirit through the gospel and then command what you will. And I think Augustine meant that, but that's the way we need to see it. God gives us grace first 
And then he commands us because apart from his spirit, we cannot do it. The Lord first makes us new creatures in Christ. He writes the law on our hearts. And then he gives us, you say, through that, the ability to obey him. But again, because we're still not perfect, we need the command to remind us to obey. By the way, by saying that, I don't mean that, that God, God's commandments don't bear on us even if we don't have the Spirit of God. The commandment does, in a certain sense, come first to convict us of our sins and to drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ. But having come to Jesus, he gives us the ability to do what he commands. Now, this morning, we come to what Jesus has to say about the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. And again, he's going to remind us that keeping the letter of the law is not going to be enough. We need to keep it in our hearts as well. But he also goes on to tell us how we can do this, even as believers. I mean, we can't do it unless we are believers, but as believers, how are we to deal with the sins of the heart, which lead to the sins in actions? Well, first of all, Jesus reminds us again of what it is he's really talking about when he's, when he's quoting the seventh commandment. He's quoting it not to correct what God said, the law um, was, of course, from Jesus' perspective, the law was really his own word. He's the one who is the logos. He's the word of God. It was through his spirit that the law was actually given. His spirit inspired it. But that's not what he's correcting. He's not correcting the, the, the commandment itself, but he's correcting what the Jewish leaders were teaching regarding that commandment. Notice again how he introduces the subject in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, this is what God said. I mean, this is the seventh commandment. But again, the way he introduces it reminds us that he's not talking about the seventh commandment itself, but he is talking about the rabbinic interpretation of that commandment. Again, you have heard that it was said. That's the Jewish tradition that was taught by the Jewish leaders. You know, and what they taught was that the only thing that God had in mind here by this particular commandment was the actual act of adultery, which we know is a sexual relationship between a man and a woman when one or both are married to someone else. Now, Jesus is, of course, going to address the rabbinic tradition uh, from this point, also regarding divorce and remarriage and how that bears upon the issue of adultery. And we're going to look at that this evening. But let's look at what he says here about sins of the heart. Jesus tells us that the commandment is farther reaching than the act itself. Like the last commandment, the sixth commandment we looked at, it also deals with the heart. Okay, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But then he goes on in verse 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I want, to notice, I want us to note, first of all, that Jesus is addressing men in this passage. But we do need to understand it's not exclusively a man's problem, is it? although it might be more often than it is for a woman. But perhaps he puts it in terms of, of man because man has more of a problem in this area, or it could be because generally that's just the way that Jesus speaks. Now, we know when he goes on to address divorce and remarriage, again, he's going to put it in terms of a man and what he does with his wife and another man who might marry her and so forth. But in other parts of the Scripture, it also brings up the fact that a woman might put away her husband and if she doesn't do it on biblical grounds, she's going to run into exactly the same problem. So it is a problem for both. It may be more of a problem for men than for women, but maybe not in our culture today. I, I don't know. I only know what it's like from a man's perspective. But Jesus does recognize it is for both. But notice, secondly, what Jesus is actually saying here and what he's not saying. Because sometimes we can take even this commandment and maybe go a little bit too far with it. He's not telling us that it's a sin to look at a man or look at a woman and to f judge them to be handsome or pretty. Okay, that's, that's not the issue here. The word that he uses 
is really what's at, what's at issue. The word which expresses a strong desire. That's why it's called lust. And by the way, this strong desire, this word for strong desire, epithumia, can actually be used in good contexts and bad contexts. We should strongly desire what is good, but not strongly desire what is bad. And in this case, with reference to adultery, what he's talking about here, of course, is a strong desire to engage in activity with that individual that would only be appropriate if we were married to them, you see. To indulge in this desire in our hearts or in our minds with someone other than the one to whom we're married would be to break the seventh commandment, to lust after somebody else's wife or being married to lust after you know, even a single person. Now, I'm going to put, just pause for a moment and, and just say one other thing, and I just want to mention briefly what we know is true about all the commandments, that it's, it's even further reaching than just this, okay? It's more than just adultery. It, uh, remember the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments to be a summary of everything that He requires, and not everything is explicitly spelled out in each of these commandments. But everything we should see that has to do with this category is certainly implied by the commandment. Now, Jesus tells us in this example of, of you know, the true intent of the law and the last one that he gave us regarding murder that God originally intended the commandments to govern our hearts as well as our actions, even though the commandment itself does not explicitly say that. It's implied in the commandments, okay? We know for other things about the commandments as well from a further study of Scripture that the opposite of what is forbidden is commanded with regard to murder. We are not to murder, but we are to protect life. Now, it doesn't say in the commandment that we are to protect life, but that is implied by the commandment. And the same thing is true here with regard to adultery. We are not to lust after somebody else, but rather we are to protect their purity and our own purity. We also know that the opposite of what is commanded is forbidden, and I hope you could, this is the opposite of what I just said. For instance, we are to honor our parents and all authority, and we are not to dishonor them. So if it's put in a negative way, we know that the positive, the opposite positive applies. If it's put in a positive way, the opposite negative applies. We also know that we are not only to keep the commandments ourselves, but we are to desire our neighbor to keep the commandments. And for example, the Lord calls us to keep the Sabbath day holy by resting from our work and worshiping the Lord. We are also to help other people do the same by not being a cause of their having to work. Now, all of this is to say that the Lord tells us about everything that is right or wrong in the area of human sexuality in this commandment, even if it isn't explicitly mentioned. If it isn't mentioned here, it's mentioned in other parts of Scripture. And we know that that is what the Lord would have us to do. He tells us that His commandments are exceedingly broad, which means that they contain more than they do at face value. And we know what they contain by reading the whole of Scripture. So what is it that is implied in this commandment that isn't explicitly mentioned? Well, this commandment would also forbid those who are unmarried from engaging in sexual relationships. It would forbid them also from lusting after each other. Just because you're not married doesn't mean it's okay. okay? There's, there's sexual sin involved in, with non-married people. Uh, since we are called by the Lord to help our neighbor keep this commandment as well as keeping it ourselves, it teaches us that we need to be careful that we conduct ourselves in such a way when we're around one another that we don't say anything or do anything that would provoke lust in other people. We need to be careful that we don't view things that would cause us to do that. And there's plenty out there that's going to perhaps provoke that in us, but we're going to see how to deal with that toward the end of this sermon. Now, I know that this is a touchy area, but we need to, to also, you know, it's not touchy among us, but it is in our culture. This commandment speaks against homosexuality as well. And it tells us that it's a sin to lust after somebody who is of the same gender, okay? 
uh, it speaks against the gender confusion that we have within our culture, the, what we call gender dysphoria, the desire to be a gender other than the one that the Lord has made us, as well as gender reassignment, you know, what we call a sex change operation. That's actually, I hope we all understand, not only forbidden, it's not only sin, but it's impossible. You know, we can only change our appearance. We can't change what we are. God made us male or female, and we can no more change that than we can change ourselves into any other creature that the Lord has made. I mean, we might be able to make ourselves look like uh, another animal, or I should say not another animal. I wanted to avoid that because we're not animals. We might be able to make ourselves look like them in some way, but we cannot become them. And the same thing is true in this regard, and it would be sin on our part even to attempt it. We do need to remember this as a general principle, that we have sin in our hearts. Even we do as believers who have the Spirit of God working in us, but the people who aren't believers don't have the Spirit working in them, and that evil that is in their hearts is constantly at work trying to overthrow and pervert everything that God has made. So the point is, just because somebody wants something, just because somebody thinks it's right, just because we want it, doesn't mean it's right or it's good. We always need to evaluate our desires or judge them by the only true standard that God has given to us, and that is by His Word and by His law. Now, let me just again point out why it's important we do that. It's not only because not to do so is sin, but God forbids sin because ultimately it is harmful to us. It is injuring ourselves, it's injuring our neighbor, it's offending God. There's nothing good about it, but everything He calls us to do is good, and it's right, and it's loving. It's good for everyone, for ourselves, for our neighbor, and it is pleasing to God for that very reason. But how do we know what fits into that category? But only by reading God's Word. We need to read God's Word. Now, we should also note here what we also noted under the Sixth Commandment, that breaking this commandment in our hearts is, it is a breaking of the commandment, but it's not the same thing as committing the act itself. And again, I just wanted to point out there are degrees of severity. Wanting to kill your brother, wanting to murder him, and actually murdering your brother are two very different things that carry different consequences. The desire to break the commandment, murdering your brother in your heart, does not carry the death penalty with it. Thankfully, because we'd all then be liable to the death penalty because we have likely all done this at one point or another. We don't see anybody executed in the Old Testament for getting angry at their brother. Now, the same is true here with regard to this strong desire that we may have, this lust after somebody else's spouse, or even for an, er an unmarried person if you happen to be married, that breaks the commandment, but it doesn't violate certain things. It doesn't violate the one flesh union that you have with your spouse because you haven't become one flesh with another. It doesn't have the potential to, to conceive a child out of wedlock. Just thinking about it won't produce that. And nor do I believe does it give the grounds for divorce because the act actually hasn't occurred. But the point Jesus is making here is not that it's the same but that it is still serious, and we need to take it seriously. I mean, look at what Jesus said about murder. We've already seen to murder a brother in our hearts is to make us guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. He's told us that if we're not willing to go to our brother when we have offended them to be reconciled with them, that the result is the same. We will not be reconciled to God, just as if we're unwilling to forgive somebody who comes to us, the result is the same. God will not forgive us. It means we have not received, again, His mercy and grace if we're unwilling to forgive others. He tells us in this passage that if we do not deal with our lusts, if we don't tear out the eye that stumbles or cut off the offending hand, that we will be thrown whole into hell. Now, the implication there is that if we're saved, we will do that. We will pluck out the eye, we'll cut off the hand, we'll come back to that in a minute to make sure we understand what He means by that. We will do that so that we won't be thrown into hell. We will do that so that we will not continue to lust after others. That's what the grace of God does. 
Now again, remember what Jesus said earlier. Our righteousness must be greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees or we will not enter into his kingdom. This is one of the ways in which it must be greater. The Pharisee might have said, I haven't committed adultery, I'm righteous. But yet he's broken it in his heart. Jesus says you need to not only refrain from doing it in your actions, you need to fight against it in your heart. The temptation will be there, but fight against it. You have the power, you have the ability. And again, as I mentioned, there are degrees of sin, but let's remember that every sin, I've just giving you a few examples, unforgiveness, not willing to reconcile, hating your brother in your heart, lusting in your heart, being unwilling to put those lusts to death. Every sin, even the smallest, deserves condemnation. It deserves damnation. But the good news is, if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, no sin will ever condemn us. This is the way the Westminster Assembly put it, and those of you unfamiliar with the Westminster Assembly, that was the group of men who met 120 doctors and, and ministers in the church, the top men of the age, debating over a period of several months, putting together a confession that would unite the three kingdoms, uh, uh, the three countries that, that were in the UK and so forth. They wanted to replace the, uh, the articles of the Church of England and, and have something that was better. Uh, they wrote this, and what they wrote is, is entirely true. In Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 15, section 4, they say, as there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. Again, pointing out, even the smallest sin deserves damnation. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. And that's what you do if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you're trusting in the Lord, you will love him and you will turn from all your sins. You will repent, not just of some, not just 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100, but you will turn from all of those sins and because of that, no sin that you've ever committed will condemn you because Jesus died for them. Now, if you haven't repented and trusted Jesus, know that you're still liable for all your sins. But if you do come to him, if you do trust him, not only will he forgive all of your sins so that you will never be condemned by, by the least or the greatest of them, he will also give you the power to become what it is he's talking about in this sermon. Remember, it's not do this and you will live, but trust in Jesus and he will give you the power to do this and you will live. You will live because of Jesus, not because of your own strength. Jesus will make sure that you meet the personal qualifications that he says you must meet if you are to enter into his kingdom. That's what God's word says. Now finally, if we have trusted him, what does Jesus say that we need to do in order to overcome this sin? And by the way, I think when he says this, it applies not just to this sin, but to every sin that we might be struggling with. Well, he tells us in verses 29 through 30, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So how do you overcome this? Jesus says, we need to tear out the offending eye and cut off the offending hand. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but Dick and I were talking about this this morning, and he reminded me that in the early church, there were people who took this literally and actually were cutting off parts of their body to overcome their sins. Now, I think you know by now that that's not what Jesus means, that we should not do this literally. Because if we tore out our right eye, we still have a left eye, don't we? And we can still see and we can still lust. And if we tore out both of our eyes, we still have a memory and a mind and an imagination and we can still commit these sins. If we cut off our right hand, we still have the left and so forth. It's not that the problem, you see, the problem isn't with the eyes, the problem isn't with the hands, but rather the problem is with what we're, what's motivating them, see? It's with our hearts. So Jesus is telling us here not that we need to cut off the members of our bodies, but he's telling us that we need to cut off the desires 
to commit these sins. Now think about this for a minute. If the desire for these things was completely gone, then you would have no problem in these areas. You would not commit these sins. If you were like Jesus, you would not commit these sins. Jesus never lusted after a woman. Jesus never hated his brother and wanted to kill him. He not only kept the law in his actions with his hands, but he also committed the, you know, kept them in his heart. Uh, he was perfect. And if you and I had that perfection, then we would also be able completely to overcome the sin. It would be gone, right? But the problem is, we're not like Jesus right now, and we're not going to be like him in this world. So what is it that we can do? Well, we can weaken it. We can, we're supposed to try to put it to death, but even though we can't completely kill it, at least we can weaken it. And the weaker it is, the weaker that sin is, and the stronger God's love in our hearts is, the more power we will have against that sin of lust as well as every sin that we might be tempted. The best defense we can have against lust or any desire is to kill it in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit and to grow in our love. Now, we can only do this through the Holy Spirit. We can only do it to the degree that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we will only be filled with the Holy Spirit to the degree that we seek His help through the ways that the Lord has actually given us to seek Him. And I think you're familiar with what those ways are. I mean, why should we pray? You know, why, why do we pray? Well, the Lord says we can't really get anything unless we ask in prayer, and whatever we ask for, we can get, and we're all familiar with that. But how many times have you asked for the Holy Spirit? For more of the Holy Spirit, to seek Him for His help to overcome these sins. That's how you get more of His help. You get more of His help by reading the Word of God and by believing what the Word of God says. The Spirit of God will give you the ability to do that. And He's given you promises to, uh, that you will overcome your sins if you simply trust Him, if you simply appropriate the reality of what has actually happened to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to strengthen your conviction. You need to strengthen your faith that it is true by reading the Word of God. If you stay away from the Word, it fades from your mind. If you don't ask for help, you're not going to get any help. You need to be in these things. We need to be together on the Lord's Day, not just to hear the Word and to pray together and to worship, but to encourage one another. I mean, it's, it encourages each one of us when we see each other, when we see each other loving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, being interested in the things that are actually being said here. We encourage one another in our worship, and we can't do that if we're not here. And in our fellowship that follows, we, we can encourage and build one another up in a way that we will not receive if we're not here, or if we happen to be spending our time with, with unbelievers, and we're not there to share the gospel with them, but we're there to pal around with them. That will not build us up. That will not encourage us. The, the Bible says that will actually take us further away from the Lord. We need to be together in order to fellowship. And of course, participating in the Lord's Supper, which is a spiritual meal. If we, by faith, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus is here, as well as a physical meal, and then using the help that the Lord actually gives us to push forward. You know, I think the same thing is true with us as is true of any object in motion. When an object is in motion, you know, it, it, it perhaps takes a little bit more force to get it to, to move or deviate because it has momentum going one direction. And if you have more momentum going one direction, it'll be more difficult for you to stop, go the other direction, or to veer to the right or the left if you're intent on moving forward. So you take what the Spirit of God gives you, you commit yourself to doing things the right way, and you move in that direction. As the author to the Hebrews says, fixing your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, setting aside the things that, you know, that, that stumble and, and that encumber the sin which so easily entangles us and run the race, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Move in His direction towards Christ-likeness. It doesn't mean get a ladder and start trying to climb to heaven. It doesn't mean you're physically running in one direction, but what it means is that your heart is intent on becoming like Jesus and doing 
what it is that Jesus wants you to do. The more you push in that direction, the harder it's going to be for any sin to tempt you and to get a hold of you. If we'd only learned that lesson, we'd have a lot less difficulty. So we need to build ourselves up in our love for what is right, in our love for Him, in our love for our spouses, our love for our children, our love for our neighbors, so that we would not want even to entertain any sinful thoughts that would dishonor them in any way. May the Lord give us the grace to do that. He wants our hearts to be pure as well as our lives, our actions. Now, as we prepare to come to the table, let, let's remember this, that our Lord Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to take all of our sins, even the guilt of our lusts and all of our other sins upon himself and to die in our place. And let's remember that he died not just to free us from the guilt of sin that would have condemned us, he died to free us from the power of sin to command us by giving us his Holy Spirit. So as we come to the table, let's remember to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, to remember him, and to look to him by faith, to strengthen his grace in us, to kill every desire that is contrary to his will, and to put on love that we might be able to do what he calls us to do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us.